Well, hello everyone and welcome. I'm Chris Miller, the director of the Eurasia program at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Very pleased uh, to welcome you to a uh, discussion of a new book that FPRI has just published um, last week on Russia's war in Syria. Uh, we're here with uh, three of the um, contributors uh, to that book for, for a discussion on the chapters that they've written. Um, I'll turn over the floor in just a minute uh, to Bob Hamilton, who's a senior fellow at FPRI. Um, but before that, I'll encourage uh, all the audience members uh, who are not currently um, subscribers to FPRI's publications or members of FPRI to go onto our website at fpri.org uh, and hit subscribe uh, to learn more. Um, so Bob, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thanks again for moderating this discussion and looking forward um, to hearing what our panelists have to say. Thanks, Chris. Uh, happy to be here and thanks for the invitation to moderate. So we're lucky to have, uh, as you said, two of our chapter authors, uh, Anna Barshevskaya and Michael Kaufman here. And uh, you have their bios. You can see them in the, uh, in the announcement, in the invitation to the meeting. So I won't recount those. I will just tell you, Anna is a fellow at the uh, Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Michael is an analyst at CNA. Uh, they really are two of the preeminent uh, US experts on the Russian military. So what we're gonna do is I'll turn it over to each of them in turn to give brief summaries of their chapters of the book. And then I'll ask a few questions and then uh, I will moderate audience questions. So if you do have questions, there's a the Q and A window, we'll go ahead and submit those. Uh, and uh, at about uh, 30 minutes, I'll start to moderate audience questions. Until then, uh, Anna, Mike and I will talk about uh, their chapters. So Anna, let me turn it over to you. If you could give us uh, a brief summary of your chapter, the main conclusions and takeaways. Sure, thank you very much, uh, Bob. Um, so um, uh, in my chapter, I um, start talking briefly about the geopolitical context for Russia's Syria intervention. Um, and uh, again, just, you know, I'm gonna give a few brief, brief points that we can expand on during the conversation, but um, basically Russia had multiple um, interests uh, uh, in Syria. Um, it, there's not just one or two, uh, but fundamentally, uh, the primary uh, motivator was erosion of the U.S.-led global order, the perception that the, the U.S.-led global order has disadvantaged um, Russia, and it's a culmination of a pursuit of a multipolar world that the Russian state had been pursuing uh, for many years under Vladimir Putin. Um, so, um, and another point is that Moscow calculated correctly uh, that the West would not oppose its military intervention. Uh, in Syria, and this is a, this was an important factor in, in a calculation. Uh, for many years, the, the Kremlin perceived the Russia, the West, as weak, uh, and clearly the the West was not focusing uh, on Assad. There, there was a fairly limited um, interest beyond uh, counter ISIS, um, uh, um, and frankly, for all of Western talk about Assad must go, the West really was not uh, willing to uh, match that talk with with action, and that was not lost on the Kremlin. Um, so uh, later in the chapter, I talk about a few, a few points. I talk about Moscow's approach to war um, and counterterrorism, um, as well as the Russian state overall uh, perception of threat, which, which is an important element uh, uh, of, of this situation. Um, I also talk about the Russian military campaign in Syria, more for in, in broad strokes. The other, uh, other author uh, chapters in this anthology talk in more detail about the technical military issues. Uh, but I talk about more of a broader picture stuff. Uh, but I also touch a little bit on uh, the diplomatic track um, and how the two really reinforced uh, each other. There was, there was a lot more unity uh, on the Russian state uh, pursuit of its goals in Syria than, than on the Western side. Um, and finally, I conclude with discussion of uh, conflict resolution in Syria and whether Russia uh, is able and willing, frankly, um, uh, to, to lead this effort. Um, as, as a bottom line up front, again, my main conclusion is that uh, Moscow, uh, Moscow's actions show clear um, adaptation uh, change uh, to new reality. This is not the Soviet Union. This is a very different Russia, uh, a much more flexible Russia, frankly. Um, but when it comes to uh, fundamental values, um, uh, that are at the core, uh, at the core of what drives behavior when it comes to war and counterterrorism. Fundamentally, these core values have not changed. Um, the West and Russia fundamentally did not share the same goals uh, in Syria. Um, uh, in terms of threat perception, uh, state survival has been uh, and still remains a key goal, a key motivator that drives the Russian state. 
um, and it is linked to um, a perception of threat coming from the West, looking to deter um, uh, and undermine the West. Um, the Kremlin has always perceived uh, threats to its regime from uh, uh, um, color revolutions, uh, Arab Spring, um, and so forth. Um, and so this, uh, this, the, the idea of regime survival uh, remains linked to its perception of the West and perception of the West uh, undermining uh, the Russian state. Um, and in terms of conflict resolution, just to, again, a bottom line up front, um, Russia, first of all, um, uh, it, first of all, Russia doesn't have the resources nor the ability to really uh, drive conflict um, resolution the way the West would understand it. I think that's an important um, disclaimer. Um, we in the West uh, tend to associate conflict resolution with genuine reconciliation, um, with investments in uh, a post war reconstruction and so forth. Um, this is not what the intervention was about and you don't see the Russian state being uh, uh, genuinely invested in this. Uh, but also more fundamentally, the, uh, the Russian state benefits from low level conflict. Um, and it's a situation that the Russian state can live with for a very long time, even if it's not ideal. Uh, Moscow, there, there's no shortage of Russia uh, uh, starting uh, so-called frozen conflicts on its periphery. Uh, and I think in many ways, Syria will become another frozen conflict that Russia is going to manage. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Anna. Uh, that was a great summary. There are several threads I want to pull on there uh, that I think will make for some interesting questions. Before I do that, uh, let me turn it over to Michael and, and ask you to do the same uh, brief summary of your, your chapter and the key takeaways and conclusions. Uh, thanks, Bob. And uh... Thanks for uh, both convening this fantastic edit volume and an opportunity to sort of present a short takeaways from my chapter. So this will be somewhat of a very brief teaser. The chapter covers a bit how Russia got into the war, the strategic thinking behind it, and then dives into military strategy, the organization of the campaign, kind of operational design. And there's a lot of details there on command and control, performance of forces, but also the main takeaways for the Russian forces, what the Russian military thinks to learn got an opportunity to test and develop in Syria. Naturally, I'm gonna get into very little of that here in this uh, brief presentation. So <clears throat> I'll start with a bit of the background. So uh, you know, the way Russia got into the conflict is essentially um, Syria becomes important in Russian strategy for the region for dealing with the United States and especially for its military because of the intervention. Um, the intervention was not because of Syria's actual importance. In fact, it's somewhat an accident of history that you know Syria is where Russia and American forces end up meeting. Uh, after 2015, um, a lot of the Russian initial objective was really a fear that uh, the United States would see Libya as a model and try to carry out this kind of regime change in Syria. Although the United States did not have such intentions of conducting similar intervention, it became clear that the proximate cause was the fact that Assad was going to lose in 2015. Jabal loser in the north, ISIS in the east. And so the Russian policy to avert a forceful overthrow of Assad since 2011 was basically failing. They were kind of a decision point. And so the short, big strategic objectives I would outline, um, and here we can draw, I think, I think a lot of similarities with what I am thinking, is a strong desire to draw a red line against what they perceived as U.S.-driven regime change in this case and serve as a counterweight to the United States, um, an opportunity to take the confrontation with the U.S. to a flank theater on much more favorable terms, forcing the U.S. to deal with Moscow as an equal and without a concerted front of allies like America has in Europe. Um, and there was also a Russian vision that collaboration in Syria could eventually supersede the confrontation over Russian actions in Ukraine and that they could somehow get the U.S. and Europeans to abandon sanctions in Europe. That, of course, never came to pass. They sought to reframe U.S.-Russia relations. And the last point is that many in Moscow saw this as a preventive conflict. They believed Syria would ultimately implode and either Jab al Nusra or ISIS would win, and that would eventually destabilize the region. So they had the sort of typical mantra, it's best to fight them over there than over here type of rationalization. And I've heard this plenty of time before in, in different countries. Military strategy was aimed at restoring state power, not Assad's regime sort of personally, uh, and attain a political settlement on terms that would be established by the military campaign. But Russia was fundamentally there not to do nation state building or classical stability operations of the kind uh, we've done in the past. Um, this was really about restoring the state's authority and destroying what they saw as the, as the opposition. The strategy was fundamentally emergent. It required many regular course corrections when assumptions were proven wrong and they were actually right off at the start um, and, and fairly lean. Plus there were many allies with competing objectives 
and Russians saw that, okay, the Allies would be doing the bulk of the fighting on the ground, so their prerogatives had to be reflected in national strategy. And national strategy could be characterized as based on the reasonable sufficiency, avoiding a means-driven approach to strategy at all costs, keeping the footprint small, keeping the cost down, and take a gradualist approach over time, rather than trying to dominate the battlefield or own it or take ownership of the whole campaign. Um, so last but not least, well, Russia did label all the opposition as terrorists. Their goal was to destroy their sort of viability as part of a larger coercion strategy to convince external parties to the conflict that they needed to negotiate on favorable terms because Moscow basically saw this as driven externally and they believed the war couldn't end if Turkey, the U.S., and the other Arab states believed that their proxies could win, right? So it had to be a strategy to essentially convince the external parties to, uh, to abandon their military efforts. Um, the chapter covers quite a bit on operational performance, um, and, and I won't delve too much into those details here, but it talks about sort of the evolution of Russian aerospace forces in this conflict, sort of the good, the bad, and the ugly of the campaign, um, and, uh, and, and the transition of the forces over time. And what it basically comes out to is that you see a real, real evolution in the Russian military, both as a result of Russian military reform modernization efforts, this being the real first combat experience for Russian aerospace forces, and other important elements of the Russian military. Um, and it shows that Russia has made huge strides and continues to advance in terms of operational art and design. Um, it still has very visible tactical weaknesses when it comes to aerospace power, uh, the ability to marry um, uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance assets with precision guided weapons and so on and so forth. But Syria continues to be a uh, an evolution in the Russian armed forces when it comes to those questions. Um, the impact on the Russian military, and I'll close out with this because I think that if we take a military perspective, uh, this is probably one of the most uh, important elements to discuss. So Syria is going to be by far the most influential conflict on Russian military thought, modernization, and doctrinal uh, adaptation um, in, in recent times. From Russian military sees this as the good war. This war is more valuable to them than any strategic exercise. They came to Syria and they want to stay in Syria. This is where all senior Russian commanders go to rank up now. A large part of aerospace forces have been rotated to Syria, a very significant percentage of the crews. It is used to bloody and harden the Russian armed forces. Um, all senior commanders have basically gone to this conflict, some more than once, and it's created an entire generation of officers who feel that not only did they all serve in the war, they feel they served in the war that they had won, okay? Um, in Syria, you have a lot of operational concepts that are being further tested, developed, and refined. Recon strike, recon fire loops, the ability for Russian military to use mass firepower or precision guided weapons married with targeting assets in real time and sort of complete this more complex kill chain, which is a fairly uh, recent development in the Russian military. Operate increasingly at night, one area where Russian military is historically deficient, where the United States and, and uh, Western countries basically could own the night on the battlefield. Engage targets in real time, function as a more networked military with much more flattened command and control uh, and, and a much more flat echelon of system, and become more flexible at the tactical level. Those who follow the Russian military know that it's tactically inflexible by design and very flexible at the operational level when it comes to operational art. But tactically, the Russian military works very differently from the United States and as, and as by intent. And so one, one of the things that Syria is driving is some, some tactical innovation as well. And, and the development of what Russia calls a non-standard solution. Big point is here is Russian military never saw Syria really as a CT fight. It is not a counterterrorism fight. They always saw their opponent as a very heavily conventionally armed opponent. Yes, they didn't have aircraft, okay? They did not have the capabilities the United States had, but they did see ISIS Jabal al Nusra as a fairly heavily armed military, and they saw this as a fight um, with real uh, tangible lessons that could be brought into Russian strategic command staff exercises. You know Kafkaz uh, 2020 is kicking off right now. And to bring these lessons and spread them to the Russian military writ large. Um, one of the biggest takeaways that were important for the Russian military, Syria, where they came, they could interact for a sustained period of time with the US military. And they get very valuable intelligence collection from dealing with US platforms, whether it's signals, intelligence collection, where it's building your coalition database of US aircraft, data of interactions from US aircraft, employment of electronic warfare and various other means, sitting in the middle of two US cruise missile strikes and see what, what are the ability of your, uh, uh, the air defense component of your aerospace forces, what they can do, what they can't do, 
these sort of things. And this is sort of pretty essential because there's really no other place in the midst of ongoing modernization where the Russian forces could have gotten some of these interactions. So for them, it was invaluable, the, the day-to-day um, uh, interaction they had with U.S. armed forces in that conflict. And it helped shift the debate in the current state armament program a lot more away from platforms and much more towards the key enabling capabilities and sort of the missing pieces that the Russian military had. Uh, I'll conclude kind of this point and say that when we look towards the future, I think one of the challenges we tend to have when we look on an expeditionary operation in the Middle East is, so one of the principal assumptions on our, uh, on our intents to be uh, that the purpose of an expeditionary operation in the Middle East is uh, to eventually leave, okay? That, that leaving constitutes victory. And the sooner we can go out because we don't really want to be there, we'd rather be somewhere else always, that until you leave, it's some kind of a quagmire. And we don't understand that a lot of other great powers, when they go to places, they actually go there to stay. There's not a Russian plan to leave. There's a Russian plan to stay and to leverage Syria for a wider Russian role in the Middle East, for Russian involvement in Libya and other places. And the Russian military doesn't want to leave. It sees Syria as essential to the further military transformation, to modernization efforts and so on, right? So it's important that when we often tend to say, Russia doesn't have a solution for Syria. Ah, uh, Russia doesn't plan to have a solution for Syria, okay? That's not the Russian goal. It, most of Syria is a serious problem. Even when we look at Idlib and this part of the campaign does not gone nearly as well for Syrians when it comes to dealing with Turks. I think the Russian answer to that is Idlib is not a Russian province. That is a Syrian problem, okay? What happens in Idlib at the end of the day doesn't make that much of a difference to Russia, right? But we can continue, we can discuss that point and talk about what the future holds. Uh, on that, I'd like to close my remarks, turn it over back to you. Okay, thank you both. Uh, those are great summaries of your chapters and, and just a, a lot of great things uh, to, to pull on there. Let me, uh, let me start with the hardest question and that is how does this end for Russia? So what is the, the likely outcome of Russia's intervention in Syria and what does it mean for Russia's role in the region? That question is for me. <laughs> both of you, but yeah, let's go, let's go chapter two, chapter three. So I'll, go ahead and start Anna and then I'll, we'll let Mike talk. Sure. So I don't, um, I, look, I think the short answer is no one knows how this is going to end. Um, and I think that that's also, in and of itself, I think it's a very Western question and that when we think about strategy, uh, we always ask how this is going to end. Um, I'm not sure, and, and maybe Michael can talk more about this, but I'm not sure if that's um, how necessarily how the Russian leadership uh, is thinking about it. Because, and I, I completely agree with Michael, the Russian military is there to stay. Um, and it, it is, um, it, it's, it's uh, awarded, um, the, the, the stay in Syria is, has already given Russia numerous advantages in terms of power projection capabilities, in terms of expansion um, into, uh, deeper into the region. Um, also don't forget, look, the Eastern Mediterranean um, historically is uh, a place where the Russian state has always sought um, a, a dominant position. It didn't just, it's not just the Soviet Union, the Russian czars had pursued, um, uh, ha had pursued a position there. It, the Soviet Union followed and we're now seeing, you know, another iteration uh, of that pursuit. And that's for good reason. If you look at the world, uh, again, geostrategically, if you simply even look at the map uh, from the Russian perspective, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean is, is strategically important. Um, and, you know, how this ends, I think um, I, I, there's so many ways to look at this in terms of when will this end and how would you define that end. Uh, but I think the short answer is that Russia is not leaving. Um, it is going to remain com um, uh, committed to utilizing few resources, um, uh, which was, a big, again, a big difference from the Soviet Union's approach to the region. Uh, and Michael has talked about this in his remarks also, it, it, and, and I talk about it in my chapter, Russia relied on proxies to do all the heavy lifting. Um, and uh, 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 for the time being, there's a lot of advantages uh, to, to being there. Um, I don't think, uh, I, I remember I was one of the few people, and I think Michael was also one, was one of the few people who were very skeptical that Syria would turn into a quagmire. Um, for Russia. I, I don't think that's what this is at all. Um, uh, you know, how this end, uh, I think to a large extent will also depend on broader developments within Russia, because historically, um, Russia always had interests in the Middle East, but it was often other developments that had nothing to do with the Middle East that uh, required Russia to retreat uh, from that region and then return eventually. So that's my very long answer to your complex question. <laughs> 
Okay, thanks, Anna. Uh, Michael, over to you. Yeah, thanks. I'll jump in uh, and, and add the uh, Anna's great comments. So first, from the military side, uh, it, as I expressed it, it, it became actually clear uh, only a couple of years ago that Russian forces really were beginning to dig in, entrench, build revertments, build aircraft shelters. Like in the last two years, it became much clearer the Russian military really plans to stay and wants to stay for all sorts of institutional reasons because of the transformation to the force. Some people tend to focus on testing capabilities and all that, and that's for sure a factor in those inputs, but often the lowest level conversation is the conversation about things, right? The higher level conversations about people and ideas. And, that, and Syria is having a huge impact on Russian military in that respect. Um, but when we look to step back and look at sort of uh, the conversation on strategy, first, Russia can always lead. It can lead pretty quickly. The size of the Russian contingent is basically a mixed aviation regiment that's somewhere between 3,000 to 5,000 5, men total. They can lead fairly quickly, right? Um, and they can reframe politically the intervention if they have to go. But their basic perspective is Middle East responded very positively to Russia's intervention, okay? All these Middle Eastern leaders started taking Russian calls. They got excited that there's another power other than the United States because they've been opening the refrigerator and only seeing one brand there for 30 years. And they were ultimately so leveraged to this one brand as they realized in the Arab Spring that the United States can be a fair weather's friend. Once people saw that the United States essentially gave up Mubarak in the Arab Spring, America's longest ally, a lot of Middle Eastern countries, I think, looked at and said, this other country, Russia, it's not going to replace America's role. Certainly nobody can replace America. But it's great to have at least one other external power you can talk to and play some kind of two-level game with. Otherwise, you're entirely dependent on the United States. Um, and then, you know, all our Middle Eastern analysts who said, ah, the Arab street will be so upset at the Russians. Uh, none of that came to be true, actually. It, a lot of the predictions of what would happen to the Russian Middle East didn't come true. Which stayed pretty consistent with a lot of the predictions I saw in the style in general what would happen in the Middle East. So in that regard, I, I think, I think we, <laughs> we, we continue that trend. Um, on the future, I think the general Russian view is that Syria represents a hub for a reframed Russian role in the Middle East. The Middle East is an ideal flank theater for the central competition with the United States and European countries in Europe. It is part of the indirect competition that is for fairly low cost and with very low risk. Russia can continue to get itself involved both in Middle East, North Africa region and Africa writ large, using Syria as a central logistical point for that position. Um, and the United States is going to chase it around this continent, okay? And this is in some ways recasting competition, as I suggested, that have been had uh, through time immemorial, probably a bit different and more smarter on the Russian end than it definitely was on the Soviet end, we will see. Soviet Union got mugged in this region, just like the United States and every other great power that shows up to Africa and the Middle East, thinking that they're going to achieve influence, but actually gets mugged by all the local actors and then uh, walked away feeling like they got robbed. Um, we'll see if this ultimately happens to Russia or not down the line. But I think resource constraints on the Russian end inherently drive a much more judicious and ultimately strategic approach to interaction engagement in the region because Russia both lacks the capability and the resources to engage in the sort of uh, strategically inept exercise that the Soviet Union pursued. But we'll see. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, so. Uh, Michael, you made the point in your opening remarks that uh, Russia does not see Syria, at least uh, operationally, as a counterterrorism fight, right? It is a fight against a conventionally armed enemy. And I think if you look at uh, how the Russians have fought and the enemies uh, that, they've, that they've prioritized, that, that's true and that makes sense. Anna, you made the, the point in your chapter that geopolitically, it is part of a larger counterterrorism strategy. So I want to give you the, uh, uh, the chance to explore that a little bit. Can, talk to us. Can you tell us... Um, how the intervention in Syria fits into Russia's larger geopolitical counterterrorism strategy and its perception of threats to Russia's interests. Sure. So um, one of the things I talk about um, uh, in the chapter is uh, the link, again, be, the link between, uh, two things. Uh, first of all, the link between domestic and foreign policy uh, that's uh, much deeper than, than is typical to Western countries. Uh, and um, second, the, uh, the perception that the West drives instability. It, the West, chiefly the United States, really, um, sort of leading this camp. Uh, and um, so, uh, you know, there's been, there's, a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of talk about Russia's concern of uh, terrorists uh, coming to, uh, onto Russian territory to stage terrorist attacks. In fact, the official uh, Russian 
reason, the official reason that Putin gave for going into Syria was precisely that. It was to say, we're going to kill terrorists in Syria so that they don't come back to Russia and kill us uh, on Russian territory. But um, uh, the, the broader picture here is that is that the West perceives uh, the United, uh, Russia, the Russian state perceives the United States driving a lot of these activities, uh, uh, whether again be it uh, be it the color revolutions or the Arab Spring. Um, the, there, there's a genuine belief. I don't think it's, and this isn't just propaganda. It's a genuine belief. I think that uh, the United States through its activities genuinely seeks to undermine Russia, uh, arms terrorist groups, uh, that, um, that it was the United States who uh, had quote unquote given the signal, for example, for protesters to come out uh, to protest against Putin in late 2011, early 2012. Um, it, it, also casts this, it also casts the world in, in, into this very dichotomous uh, camp. So it's, so it's either authoritarianism or, or chaos. Um, and in fact, what happened in Syria was, um, uh, you saw this playing out again with, with the, the Russian state labeling basically anybody who was armed and opposed Assad as a terrorist. And, um, and as Michael, my, Michael talked about this in his remarks, that the goal was to restore state authority, right? Uh, and, and, and um, the reason for this, the, the way this was cast is because you're going to have, otherwise you're going to have chaos. Uh, and you know, there are many problems with this view. And one of them is that it was Assad himself who, 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 um, who, drove, uh, who drove instability, who in, in fact, through his brutal repression of initially peaceful protests that didn't even ask for him to resign. This only happened later. The initial protests were simply about government reform. Um, uh, through violently uh, smothering the initial uprising, it, if anything, Assad himself became the key driver of, uh, of individuals joining terrorist groups and driving instability. Uh, and uh, even if you look in terms of sheer numbers, uh, Assad is responsible for more deaths, more civilian deaths uh, in Syria uh, th than ISIS. Um, and of course, you know, more broadly, if you look at Russian activities, um, if their genuine goal was to fight ISIS, uh, they didn't fight ISIS with any consistency. Their main, uh, the, the bulk of their activities was focused on uh, deterring, deterring the West uh, in, in this region. So that's, uh, that's some, those are some of the issues that I talk about. Okay, thanks, Anna. So it's, uh, it's almost 1030 and we're getting some great questions in the Q&A window, but I did want to take the moderator's prerogative and, and ask Mike, uh, one last question. You, you made the point in your chapter I thought was fascinating, Michael, and that is um, it's possible that in Syria, Russia is moving from viewing each war as an isolated event, as Gerasimov said in 2013, right, where they really, rather than uh, focus on the type of campaign they're fighting, whether it's a maneuver warfare or counterinsurgency or whatever, they focus on the context of the environment in which they're fighting it, and they build a campaign plan unique to the environment. You made the point that Syria may be changing the way they see that, uh, changing their view of warfare in, in that they may be creating a doctrinal template uh, for this type of warfare. For people who study the Russian armed forces, that is, that's a really, uh, that's a fundamental, that would be a fundamental change in Russia's approach to warfare and it would be very important. So can you talk to us a little bit about the extent to which that's happening and, and what you see uh, the outcomes of that being? Sure. Uh, thanks. I think it's a great question. So I think we do see Syria making an impact on Russian thinking, both a tactical operational level, but also from standpoint of military strategy. So prior to this, as you know, it is a Russian mantra that every conflict, every war has a context on a logic of its own, that there is no template. That may be true, of course. But the job of a general staff is to intellectualize the conflict, both the character of war come up with some doctrinal templates and approaches because at the end of the day you have to design force structure at the end of the day you have to have operational concepts at the end of the day you have to have tactical development and innovation based on the prevailing trends of modern warfare you cannot say it's going to be different everywhere we go every time military can't train that way right you have to like that's that it's not a blank powerpoint slide that at the top of the list is one bull says we're going to make it up as we go along um, that usually happens not far after getting into the conflict okay for sure Right. One of the things I talk about, the, the success where Russia had in military strategy was adaptability, right? A good military strategy is one that understands that the adversary gets a vote, right? And they have to be adaptable to the interaction with the adversary. And the second one is, it is responsive to assumptions being proven wrong. When Russia's gotten to Syria, very quickly on, they learned that they intervened too late, 
that the Syrian armed forces were gone. The only thing that was tissually holding together different pockets of fighting power was a pseudo Assad relationship and like Syrian flag. But the reality is that Syrian military was gone as an effective fighting force. And that it was going to be a much longer, harder slog. That became clear in the winter from 2015 to 2016. So they, they started shifting very quickly. Within a few months of intervention, it became very clear to them what they were really dealing with and what they were in for in Syria. Um, where we see uh, Syria beginning to drive a change in conversation in Russian militaries, first from the standpoint of military strategy, where Gerasim himself uh, announced what he calls sort of a strategy of limited actions. So Syria is now driving doctrinal uh, institutionalization of this type of expeditionary operation where the Russian armed forces can deploy in the future based around one combat branch or arm that will be the lead. In this case, it was the aerospace forces deploy a standing, what they call uh, inter-service or mixed combat grouping around them. So other elements like Lego blocks will fit around them. Around them. There'll be a command and control relationship to one of the military districts and the National Defense Management Center. And they will be able to recreate this type of operation again if they need to in another country or in another conflict. So some of this kind of dated view that, well, Russians can't do expeditionary operations, Russia's really a problem only on its border. That's not true. The barrier to entry for expeditionary operations actually is a lot lower than people in the US military think it is, okay? You don't need to have a tremendous amount of global power projection and logistics on hand. It's great the United States does, but actually a country like Russia can deliberately employ power outside of its region, in a case like Syria, with very little logistical throughput. It may not be scalable, but in many cases, it doesn't have to. That's one of the, I mean, that's one of the big takeaways. And then when we look at operational design tactics, probably the inputs from tactics are the least important. What's important from the takeaway of Syria is to begin to develop greater tactical flexibility. And that's born both of the fact that the Russian military has the technology now to do that, the command and control technology, right? The ability to drive that connectivity down to the lower echelons of forces so that decisions can be made at the lower level, we will see if the culture really changes. Syria, uh, Bob, you'll appreciate this. Syria demonstrated one of the biggest challenges early on of when you modernize the military and you deploy the technology, the ability for ground forces to work with aerospace forces and to do joint planning, but they don't want to because you can bring the horse to water and the horse just stares at you and then stares at the water and doesn't really understand what it is you want it to do. So early on in the conflict, Russian aerospace forces would just do plan uh, their flight operations with no real connectivity or intention to support ground operations, right? Like they were completely disconnected. That's actually how the aerospace forces got a ground force commander, Surovikin, as their commander. A person who has never flown any. And that's partly, that's partly what happened in Syria. He had never flown anything and that's how Surovikin took over. Um, on operational sort of design and campaign planning, in many ways, Syria was pretty traditional. The Russian military is really good if it can plan operations, get an operational pause, and then eat the elephant one by a time, right? And so you saw there basically one area where the Russian military continues to excel, which is operational planning and operational art, even with limited means, right? Where they had a long way to go in evolution was tactical development, and they still do. Um, and I'll close on that, but I think, I think that's a great question. And it's just important to highlight that in the last two years, you do really see a beginning of uh, doctrinal revolution in Russian thinking about their ability to conduct expeditionary operations and the growing comfort with them and the growing comfort with the belief that now they do have a template where they could conduct an operation like this somewhere else. When the one-off, if people say Syria is a one-off, it's not, not necessarily. Okay, great. Thanks, Michael. Um, so there's some great questions on the q and I'm going to uh, combine a couple of here, a couple of questions here that are that are sort of related. Um, first one is, how will Putin handle the relationship with Turkey uh, if there, if, if northern Syria, Idlib province and places like that, if things deteriorate further? And then secondly, sort of related to that is, um, what is Russia's, the Russian intervention in Libya uh, is that the same sort of template as they're following in Syria? Is it driven by the same set of objectives? Uh, and then what might that do to the Russian-Turkish relationship as well, right? Because they're on different sides in Libya. So two-part question, uh, focused on Turkey. Uh, how does Russia ha handle the relationship with Turkey if things go south in northern Syria? And then what does Libya say uh, about the Russian-Turkish relationship? 
Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I'm, I guess I'm going. <laughs> uh, so, so Turkey first. Oh, both great questions. Um, so first of all, with Turkey, I think there's there's a bigger context here. Um, uh, for years, Putin has been building leverage over Erdogan over multiple fronts, and in, in terms of the Russia-Turkey relationship, that has uh, that is completely separate from Syria, and I'll explain why why this is relevant. Um, <coughs> but um, so uh, what you what, what unfolded over over the last at least decade or so is a situation where Russia has a lot of levers of control, be it through the economy. Uh, for for example, the Turkish economy is heavily reliant on Russian tourists, uh, Russian energy, especially. Um, and uh, it, it, Russia is now building Turkey's first nuclear power plant. Uh, there's now, of course, the sale of the S-400. Uh, um, Russia conducts information operations in Turkey through Sputnik. And that in and of itself is a fascinating conversation. Um, and um, you're see, uh, Russia has a lot of connections with, with the Kurds in the region, uh, including the Syrian Kurds. Um, and historically, that's, historically, the Russian state played the Kurdish card, cards against Turkey. Um, in in their in their broader uh, uh, competition um, again since the czarist times now not just not just through not just with the Soviet Union um, <clears throat> so broadly speaking it, it's a disbalanced relationship a disbalanced bilateral relationship where um, uh, Russia simply has more leverage now in terms of uh, the military uh, side and specifically in Syria this this gets more interesting Thing. Uh, because, and, and Michael has argued this, the correlation of forces is, is actually more in Turkey's favor because, uh, uh, and, and Michael, I'm sure, can talk about that in more detail. Uh, but, but so it's a very interesting picture where uh, both sides uh, are, they clearly have some major disagreements. Uh, things are not, and it's unclear where things are headed, but also both sides don't want to fight a war. Uh, you, uh, and, and that's a big piece of the puzzle here, that neither Turkey nor Russia wants a serious uh, bilateral crisis. I mean, you even saw this happen in, in um, uh, very early on in the, in the Russian uh, Syria intervention where uh, the Turkish military has shut down uh, a Russian plane uh, and th there was a major standoff when th this was a NATO ally but uh, but Russia and Turkey did not go to war uh, what's been happening to date is that the two countries kept keep, keep resolving things on an ad hoc basis making ad hoc deals and oftentimes throughout the Syrian conflict again it came down to what leverage Putin had over Erdogan um, I suspect this dynamic is going to continue in other words you're going to keep having these ad hoc uh, deals that sort of uh, don't fundamentally resolve the issue, but sort of put a Band-Aid on the problem. Um, and what you've also seen is a situation, and this gets into Libya, where there's more connections between the Syrian theater and the Libyan theater with, with regard, including, uh, including with regard to the Russia-Turkey relationship, because whereas, um, uh, because uh, where Turkey is more vulnerable is in Idlib. Turkey is vulnerable to refugee flows out of Syria. And so uh, Russia had tried, uh, or at least can, can uh, talk about trying, putting pressure on Turkey through having more refugees. Uh, so that's another piece of this, this very complex puzzle. And in terms of Libya and, and Russian interests in Libya, uh, there are multiple interests. I don't think Syria is Libya um, necessarily. These are different theaters, different scenarios. Uh, th there are some similarities, and one of them is, and again, you're talking about NATO's southern flank, a strategic military position on the Eastern Mediterranean, that you can use that to leverage Europe, and uh, a position there would allow for greater power projection. Um, it's a complex, uh, different scenario with, you don't have one centralized authority, you have two. Uh, that are that are fighting. So again, this is where it gets more complex. You don't. You also don't see Russia as wedded to Haftar um, as it is it has been to Assad. Um, uh, so again, it's not a repeat, but it is an extension uh, uh, of what um, what the position in Syria has allowed Russia to accomplish. Um, well, I'll briefly add to Anne's great comments. So. I completely agree. Russia has the predominance of sort of leverage over Turkey and what is ultimately um, an asymmetric relationship. I think Russians were pretty blindsided in November 2015 because they miscalculated with Turkey and they really got angry at themselves because they thought they knew Erdogan very well. But their takeaway is Erdogan's uh, not only a bad gambler, he's never been on uh, the right side of any foreign policy bet from the Russian perspective, but he's also pretty, pretty emotional. Um, I think the truth is that Russian forces are pretty isolated when they deployed to Syria. Initially, they deployed actually without heavy air defense and other capabilities because they did think they'd be unopposed. Um, in reality, they were in a position where they could be wiped out very quickly by the three main militaries in the region, Turkey, Israel, and the United States. Um, and they knew that. 
So they had to play a pretty delicate balancing game when it came to course of diplomacy. The interaction 2015 to 2016 with Turkey, if you ever wanted to see what it looks like when a great power knuckles under a regional power, that's a very classical exhibit of what happened between Turkey and Russia between November 2015 and June 2016. By the time it came to June 2016, it was very clear that Turks realized that they were the ones that really made the mistake. There's going to be long-term friction over Idlib. Uh, it's very clear to me, I'm not a Turkey expert, by the way, nor am I a Middle East expert, uh, but it's very clear to me that, like Russia, Turkey also doesn't know where its actual borders lie and where they end. Um, that seems to be a consistency between those two. And they both try to compartmentalize relations, uh, but they have quite a number of conflicts, so that compartmentalization is going to be pretty haphazard. They're going to have a lot of crises that come up that they have to resolve. But the Russian view is that the main fight is going to be between Assad's ambitions to retake Idlib and Turkish proxies and the Turkish desire to have a cordon sanitaire there, right? And Turks are able to conduct air operations because they're not being contested by Russian airspace forces in that, in that case. And my last point on Libya. So in Libya, you did get to see Turkey try to do essentially a bit of a reverse to the Russians of what Russians did to Turkish proxies in Syria, where Turks deployed to Libya and said, ah, it's your proxies here and your mercenaries. We will use our air power, right, to change the momentum on the battlefield and to show you that Haftar can't win with your support. So in some ways, you do see some parallels. Obviously, there are significant differences. It's not clear yet how Libya will turn out. My bias is, of course, against Turkey's ability to use uh, military power deliberately. I think they put out great PR uh, of all the, you know, Panzer S1s that Libyan mercenaries have that they destroyed, and they put countless images, and they're really good at the fanfare and public relations on Twitter with us. But these are minor tactical successes, and I can only tell you one thing that's a big takeaway. Individual tactical successes when the Russian military or Russian strategies on the other side do not political or military victory make, okay? You can destroy individual Russian air defense systems in the hands of Libyan mercs all you want, or in the hands of Syrians all you want. That's not gonna necessarily amount to a victory or a political victory in the conflict. In fact, that can be a sure way to lose. Just keep PRing your individual tactical victories, but you may not achieve military success. Okay, thank you both. So the next question uh, gets to the relationship between Assad and the Syrian state uh, and the idea that restoring state power, not necessarily Assad, is, is Russia's real aim. So the question is, might it be that without Assad, there was no Syrian state or could be, could be none? Uh, any idea from, uh, from the two of you on, the, on Russian views regarding Assad's centrality to the Syrian state? Yeah, sure. I'll, sure, I'll take that one. Um, no, it's another great question. Uh, I think uh, the fundamental challenge uh, for Russia is kind of co comes back to this point in that, I, I, frankly, I don't think the Russians ever even respected Assad. Um, I, I think you can tell that even from their you know, Putin's interaction with Assad that um, um, there's just not a whole lot of respect towards him. At least that, that's how I perceived it for what it's worth. But, um, but the fact of the matter is, uh, uh, they, uh, at least the way I, the way I interpret, the way I interpreted this, they've never seen an alternative, a real viable alternative to Assad, uh, and uh, that um, has to do with the, the nature of how the Syrian state has been um, uh, shaped, um, starting with Hafez al-Assad. Um, it, it is a fundamentally different system. It, it is, it is focused on one person. Um, and uh, um, for the, uh, the, this is probably the major. Uh, reason why Russia remains committed to Assad. So it's a very interesting uh, situation where, uh, it, it, on the one hand, it's true that Russia is ultimately not interested in Assad the person. Um, but at the same time, because they've never really seen an alternative, a genuine alternative to him, um, they, they de facto remain essentially committed to him. Um, and in this sense, this is quite different from Libya, where, uh, uh, frankly, Haftar himself reached out to, to the Russians and um, Haftar clearly is an unreliable partner to everyone and, and the Russians see that and so they've built, uh, they've criticized Haftar publicly the way they've never criticized Assad. Uh, again, it's a totally different uh, scenario. Um, and um, I, I think that's a big piece of a, a puzzle as to why Russia will likely remain committed to Assad and they're, it, and they're very frustrated with him. Um, and that has even come out publicly a little bit more over the summer. But uh, despite these frustrations, um, it's hard to see an alternative to him. And it's certainly, I mean, another bigger, again, on, from a broader picture perspective, 
a person who would be uh, more favorable to Russia, even if it's not Assad, it would be somebody like Assad. And somebody like Assad uh, ultimately would not be somebody that the West could live with if it's, if it's, if it's just more of the same. Any thoughts, Michael, on that question, on those two related yeah, questions? I, th I, I think I think Anna absolutely has it. I think that it was never about him personally, but it, initially they really needed him because otherwise there was no Syria. There was nothing to tie what would have, been, would have constituted the regime's forces together or the idea even of what they were fighting for. But down the line, we also have to accept the fact that Assad is principally Iran's ally, right? And so Iran gets a very big vote what happens there. Russia puts itself in a position of the great power who is representing this coalition. And they were speaking on behalf of them and providing political cover and negotiating with the United States. But they did not, in fact, have that much leverage over Assad or Iran. They actually had to follow their progress in the conflict because they were doing the bulk of the fighting, right? This was the cost of the Russian footprint. And this was one of the uh, consequences of the strategy Russia took. So this really came out um, much later towards 2016 when Obama administration was trying to negotiate with Russia and it actually became very clear that Russia was just stalling for time because they could not deliver a national ceasefire. There was no way to save Aleppo. It was an objective of the Syrian regime and the Iranians to encircle and take Aleppo. That's it. It was not the central objective of the Russian campaign. Russians initially really wanted to drive towards Deir Azor as fast as they could to try to connect with U.S. forces and become relevant to the U.S. campaign, right? Because a large part of Syria was not about Syria for them. It was about the interaction with the United States. It was the Syrians and Iranians that pushed and the primary objective would be So um, where I think they end up now is down the line, Assad may go, and, and this is I said that it will be somebody else who will place them that kind of like that. The important thing for them is uh, restoration of the regime's uh, power and rid of authority over as much Syria as possible. And now I think their main interest is to try to get as many resources as they can on the ground towards the Syrian regime so that it is self-funded and is not funded by Russia. Because Russia has no intention of putting money towards these people, right? Um, and that's, what some of the comp that's how some of the conflicts began erupting later in 2018, 2019, as mercenaries and others would try to siege energy infrastructure. The most obvious case is Dyer Zor back in, back in 2018 and what happened there. Um, but yeah, I, I think with the rest of it, I completely, I completely agree with that. And then ultimately what happens on Assad, I don't think is that material of a question to Russia, personally. It was never about him. And when people said that Syria is a Russian ally, it wasn't. He was a client state. It was a big difference. Syria is Iran's ally. Okay, thank you both. Uh, I'm going to combine uh, two more questions that are, that are related to each other. The first one says, Russia seems to perceive the intervention in Syria as a success. Is Moscow likely to succumb to victory disease where it becomes overconfident confident about intervention in foreign civil wars? And then related to that, uh, what are your thoughts about some experts saying that Russia remains an expansionist state just as it was under czarist and Soviet regimes? Should I take that first? I think Anna's been fielding a lot of these first. I think it's definitely, sure. it's yeah. definitely my turn. Okay. Um, first, victory disease. Well, that's a terrible illness. You know, I hope, it, uh, I hope it strikes us. I hope we have like a couple military conflicts where we find ourselves politically victorious and then we find ourselves suffering from victory disease instead of blue ribbon panels discussing what went wrong and lessons learned and DC conversations about how mistakes were made. So first of all, victory disease is not terrible, so bad a disease to have if you genuinely have it. Um, I think the takeaway from Syria is not going to lead to that, to be perfectly honest, right? There was never a strong uh, desire or excitement on the Russian military to intervene in Syria. That certainly wasn't their idea going in. And they were very surprised by how well they did relative to expectations. I think they very much understand the ultimate limitations of Russian military power and the ability to project that power further away from Russian borders. And the fact that they're operating in an environment that can be very easily contested by the United States, by US allies, but more importantly, that you can get very quickly stuck in regions like the Middle East, right? Uh, in conflicts um, that, that dominate the machinations of local powers. And that happened a bit down the line in Syria. The real problem in Syria for Russia came a couple of years ago when the sort of Cold War, war of attrition between Iran and Israel got hot. 
right? And it became very much like 67, 70 with Egypt, and the Russians end up sitting in the middle of it, thinking, you know, this is the one war in the Middle East that we didn't come for, the Israeli-Iranian war that they end up in the middle of. So I understood that this is not, this is the, exactly the kind of scenario you end up with if you, want, if, you end up, if you start conducting expeditionary operations elsewhere, you'll find yourself between local and regional actors who have their own ongoing fights. And won't, I don't believe it's gonna lead to victory disease. Um, I do believe that the lessons they took away from it was that with the right command and control um, and the right organization, you can use mercenaries, you can use a limited amount of military power to achieve a decisive role in some of these conflicts, right? Especially if you're backing a side that you generally believe can win, this can have fairly low cost, and, and it's actually uh, remarkable both the low barrier to entry and how much a small amount of military power could change um, the course of one of these conflicts. You have low density of forces, uh, you have terrible training morale, so actually introducing a fairly small amount of military power can, can achieve that difference. Um, again, we will, we will continue to see the direction the stakes some Russian thinking and expeditionary operations, I don't think it's going to lead to this tremendous appetite. On the contrary, we saw back going now two years, a real shift in public attitudes and the politics in Russia where people had basically reached maximum saturation on the perceived gains from Russia's restoration as a great power, sort of, it's the optics of it as being a great power in international politics and much more focus on domestic politics and governance and these sort of issues, right? That basically the potential expected returns in Russian politics from future operations abroad are now pretty negligible, or at least this is the public mindset. And that big shift was definitely during the pension reform. Um, you could really feel public attitudes change. So I think in some respects that's unlikely, and expeditionary operations are always seen as a liability by a regime. And Syria was always that. If you looked at consistent domestic opinion surveys, it was kind of always there on the cusp, but there was, was one big thing going wrong away from Russian public asking, hey, why are we still in Syria? Um, so I, 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 don't, I, don't see, I don't see that, that necessarily taking place. The last bit um, on the question is, is it like Russian expansionist power in, 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 in uh, Soviet times and SARS regime? Well, it's quite a few hundreds of years of history. So uh, the sh by short answer on that is no, you can't even make it, you can't even really effectively construct an analogy out of that. I don't necessarily see Russia expansionist in those terms. I see Russia as fundamentally revanchist, and I see it as a power that has still failed to become a post -imperial, imperial nation state. That is like other imperial powers, it continues to fight principally for influence over. Uh, uh, over its near abroad and countries that are independent states but used to be part of the Russian Empire, the Soviet Empire, and it refuses to accept them as being independent when allowing them to attain sort of national self-determination or independent strategic orientation. I principally don't see Russia as expansionist in that role the way someone might, might cast this um, uh, as a motivation on China, right? That is, but, but the, the point is somewhat debatable. Um, and I certainly don't see the expeditionary operation in Syria as a mark of, of you know, tremendous Russian expansion. But I'd be curious to hear what Anna thinks. Sure. Uh, no, I, I agree with Michael. I think, um, you know, again, to add to what he said about the domestic opinion, that's a really important aspect uh, of, of what's happening. There is the, uh, the domestic appetite for these major military uh, campaigns has been pretty low. And in fact, you saw this with how differently the Russian state presented the Syria uh, campaign to the public than how it presented uh, Ukraine, for example. Uh, in fact, if anything, and Syria has very quickly disappeared from, uh, from Russian news and there were two, uh, m with much fanfare, there were two of these so-called withdrawal announcements um, which never really happened, but but, uh, but there was a domestic uh, element to them, I, I think. Um, what, and to add to that, what's interesting is especially what's happening in Belarus right now. The way you're seeing the Russian state um, react uh, to uh, to anti Lukashenko protest in Bel Belarus, that there's all sorts of uh, discussion about Russian interests, um, but more and more polling shows that. And, and again, first of all, polling, but also if you look at the, the, the official statements coming out of the Kremlin, it just seems that a full-on military intervention is their last uh, um, last resort. It, it just it, it's clear that they're just not interested in, in using a lot of resources. Um, uh, for, for for these types of activities, um, and this also leads to other, Michael's other point that. Um, you know, in terms of victory disease, 
to, to get to that, you, you really have to think that your power is unlimited, but the, the Russian state is to the contrary, very conscious of its limitations. Uh, and you're seeing that, I think if anything, you're gonna, you, I don't think, I just don't think that's gonna change. Uh, because when you have, because they have few resources, it also goes back to lessons learned uh, from the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was very different. Um, you don't see Russia giving away things for free the way the Soviet Union did. Um, and uh, in terms of um, uh, in terms of expansionism, I I, I agree that um, so that Russia is still in this this imperial uh, sort of post imperial state. It hasn't fundamentally changed. Uh, in that regard. Um, and Michael said something very important. Uh, quickly, I just want to go back to that from his earlier comments about Turkey and Russia having the similarity of not knowing where their borders are. Uh, I think that I think that I just want to highlight that point that he made because I think that's really important. If you look at the history of how both the Russian state and the Ottoman Empire have expanded this, um, there, there, there's more similarities than differences. Um, uh, certainly, uh, the European powers, such as the British Empire, had expanded very differently than the Russian and the Ottoman Empire, and I think that's also part of the question. Now, um, you know, the, the, this question of expansionism also comes to the broader issue of insecurity, um, and the fact of the matter is, the Russian state has always felt insecure, and that's part of what drove part of uh, what, what drove this imperial expansion, as well as confusion about borders and a whole, whole host of other issues that are too long to get into here. Um, but I think, um, I, I think because you're not seeing uh, this fundamental change from uh, this imperial mindset, uh, you're going to see Russia acting as a revengeous power. And that's the point that Michael is making. Okay, so we got a couple minutes left and uh, I'm gonna combine three questions here for the last question. Uh, there, there are three questions that to varying degrees talk about uh, the Russia-Israel-Iran uh, relationship uh, in the to the extent that Russia has tried to balance and manage relationships with both. Uh, it needs Iran as, as a partner or in, in Syria, but it also needs to avoid an escalation with Israel. A couple of the three questions that I'm looking at here mention the fact that Russia has to this point not sought to prevent Israeli strikes on uh, Iranian forces in Syria. So I guess the, the final question here is how, how can Russia manage that uh, trilateral Russia-Iran-Israel relationship uh, to its own benefit in Syria? Ending on an easy one here, right? All right, I'll, um, I can take a stab at it uh, again. Uh, I'll, I'll go first time. So Russia-Iran relations put that aside has always been pretty fraught. The big transition you had um, going into 2015 is for the entire period of sort of uh, post-Cold War history. It was very clear to the Iranians that the Iranian relationship was essentially instrumental and that Russia would consistently trade it as a pawn in its relationship with the United States when it came to key things. And Iranians were always deeply frustrated by this because they saw themselves as not having a real relationship with Russia, but one that would get traded or leveraged by Russia for other interests vis-a-vis -vis the West pretty consistently. After 2014, right, when you, you know, uh, US-Russia relations hit an idea, Russia's now sanctioned, Russians came back to Ryan and said, okay, we're sorry, we've treated you this way, now we're gonna have a real bilateral relationship and, and, and we're not gonna go back to this. Um, they end up being essentially co-belligerents belligerents in Syria. So they're allies in the conflict. They're not allies writ large. That's an important, that's the distinction with the difference. Um, there's no sort of broader Russia-Iran alliance. And Russia does not share Iran's interests either in the Middle East or vis-a-vis -vis Israel or anywhere else. I think that's fair too. And they always said enduring frustrations in dealing with Iranians. Different cultures comes out in a lot of things, right? Um, the way Russians approach making a deal and having a deal be settled. The way Russians feel Iranians approach making a deal which is the negotiations begin as soon as they end about the deal that was made and like continue renegotiating agreements on arms purchases or other things. Um, as they end up in Syria, I think what they basically saw was, you know, uh, it was very much a love-hate relationship with Iran and, and uh, the Iranian role and influence in Syria. And some years down the line, the escalation between Iran and Israel was the one very much unwanted scenario the Russian forces ended up with they had entered Syria in a way by which they first coordinated with the Israelis. That was probably the first country they really spoke to because at the end of the day, that's the most powerful military in the Middle East and the one bordering right there. And they had dissuaded the Israelis 
from seeing Russian intervention as fundamentally negative for their security interests by assuring them that the key things that Israel cared about not only would not happen, but that Russia would allow Israel to use force in Syria if they had to against Hezbollah or against Iranian forces. And they largely stuck to that deal, I think, but there were a lot of frictions. Um, and th those, are, those are interesting details. They're even worth for another panel of discussion. Um, so the, the way this relationship, I think, continues is that Russia is basically taking the inputs from Israel while not doing anything for Israel, ultimately, because Israel has pretty maximalist goals under Netanyahu to roll back Iranian presence in Syria, right? And essentially, like, listening to Israel but not giving them much of anything. And on the other hand, going to Iran and listening to Iranians, too, and also not giving them anything, which is something Russia does very well, which is listen to both parties express concern for their interests and understand that their interests are super important, but they're actually not all that important to Russia at all. Um, and, and, uh, and Russia intends to basically do nothing for either of these parties, okay? And the main Russian role is to manage escalation and make sure that its own forces don't get hurt, that incidents like what happened with the Al-20 don't take place again, even though it was Syrians that shot down the Russian aircraft, and it was actually pretty bad piloting choices, I think, by the Russians that led to that episode themselves. Anyway, I'll, 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 I'll close my comments on that, turn it over to Anna. She, she's much more of a Middle East expert than I am, to be honest. <laughs> No, th th thank you. It's a great comments. Uh, no, I, I, I agree with with uh, with Michael. Um, but here's a let me just expand a little bit uh, on what happened. Um, so uh, from a broader um, in terms of Putin's broader approach to the region in the Middle East, right? Putin has cultivated himself as somebody who talks to all sides. Um, and again, this is very different from the Soviet Union's approach to the region. In fact, it's fundamental, a fundamental shift. In the Soviet Union had clear adversaries and clear allies uh, in the Middle East. This is not what Putin's Russia is about at all. Uh, Putin builds relationships with all governments and also opposition movements to them. And um, he has and the same scenario has played out um, in uh, specifically in this relationship. Uh, a few points on Russia and Iran relationship. These are, these are historic um, adversaries but it, uh, but under Putin, they have grown uh, uh, incredibly close. In fact, uh, by 2013, uh, this is really the closest, analysts were saying this was the closest they've seen the two of them in, in the grand scope of 500 years of Russian and Iranian history. Um, and this is not the same as being allies uh, per se, um, but, um, but the fact of the matter is, uh, Russia has tilted for, for all of Putin's efforts to be uh, uh, to have contacts, quote unquote, friend to everybody in the Middle East. Uh, Russia has always shifted, uh, tilted closer to the, the basically the anti-Sunni forces, if you will, uh, the 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 Iran uh, Assad axis. And uh, again, it's not by accident. This this, this is an anti-American axis that they've always tilted closer to. Um, and um, uh, as far as Israel, Israel uh, again for Putin personally, uh, it was important to build good a good relationship with Israel for a whole host of pragmatic reasons, uh, purely pragmatic, and none of them sentimental. Um, and uh, when it came to Syria, it was Syria in particular that really brought the Russia-Iranian relationship to unprecedented heights. It's never happened before. Um, when it comes to Israel, when the Israel saw Russia on their doorstep, uh, uh, this, th they perceived this, th the way they read this, it's a great, another great power that they now have to deal with, especially in the context of American retreat. Uh, from the region and perceived a lack of American uh, interest, especially with uh, then announced uh, pivot to Asia that, that, that the Obama administration had announced. Um, what Putin has done is, yeah, as, as Michael said, yeah, right, they, they listen to both sides. Um, and as, as he correctly said, ultimately, <laughs> they, they don't really care. Uh, but uh, uh, th there's also another element to this. Uh, Russia wants, uh, Russia doesn't like any power being stronger than Russia. And so uh, if Israeli strikes, limit, uh, to a certain extent, uh, Iranian proxies, well, that doesn't hurt Russia. That actually benefits Russia. Um, 
Uh, at the same time, they've promised uh, the Israelis that they would limit Iranian influence in Syria. Uh, and unfortunately here, uh, Israelis, Israeli officials have been very naive uh, in believing that Russia is able and willing to do that. Um, despite all evidence to the contrary. Um, you have seen um, at this point less rhetoric to that extent coming out of Israel, but for many years, Israelis believed that Russia really would limit Iranian forces. But what's really happening is uh, Russia is again playing a uh, playing, uh, playing mediator uh, and uh, ultimately everybody's dependent on Russia. So you kind of have this pyramid almost, right? Russia is on top uh, and both sides see benefit and value in having Russia as an interlocutor. Um, uh, if both sides are weaker, that's that's again to Russia's benefit. So, so it's it's a power uh, relationship as well. Okay. So um, we're a few minutes after eleven, so uh, we'll we'll wrap it up here. I want to thank you both. I, I learned a lot. Uh, I've learned a lot in the last hour and six minutes on Syria, uh, and and like you guys, I've been looking at this ever since the Russian intervention. And and every time I talk to smart people about Syria, uh, like the two of you, I learn more. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, for your comments. You've given us a great picture of just how complex this is, both geopolitically and then militarily at the operational and tactical levels as well, and just how many variables, how many external players, how many internal factions there are, uh, and what a difficult process Rus Russia has to manage, but it appears to have done so fairly successfully so far. So uh, to all of you who joined us, uh, thanks very much for, for tuning in. Um, this is the second in a series of FPRI events uh, on this book. We'll go chapter by chapter. Uh, the next one is next Monday, the 28th of September. Uh, and Anna is actually going to moderate a discussion between uh, Charles Bartles and Lester Grau, who are, are authors of the uh, chapter on Russian ground forces in Syria. Uh, so check out the FPR, FPRI website for a schedule of future events on the book. Also, uh, in the chat window, there's a link to a free download of the book. Uh, and again, thanks to everyone for joining us. Michael and Anna, thank you very much for your comments, and I look forward to learning more.